Are you looking for water softener installation tips and tricks? Maybe you want to learn more because you're thinking about installing a water softener for your family, or maybe you're just thinking about having a plumber install it for you and you just want to learn more about the whole water softener installation process. Where does the drain line go? Where do you cut into your plumbing? Can it be installed without uh, soldering? Is it something you can really do yourself? Well, yes you can, and I'm gonna explain it all to you starting right now. Hi, I'm Gary the Water Guy, and I simplify water filtration to help you conquer crappy water for your family. So this video is perfect for you. Um, if you're thinking about improving the water for your family by installing a water softener, either by installing it yourself or by having a plumber do the installation for you. You want to make sure you know what to look for um, when doing an installation and uh, you <laughs> And you want to also uh, make sure you do the installation correctly. And I encourage you to watch this uh, live stream right to the end because during the live stream, I'm going to be sharing approximately 35 disasters that I've seen as uh, parts of uh, water softener installations. And uh, so that you can check out some of which, yeah, I've uh, caused them myself, I have to admit. But uh, so that you can learn more about water softener installation to avoid those disasters um, for your family if you do an installation. And uh, now whether you're watching this live or the replay, welcome. Uh, obviously the advantage of watching this live is you can submit your questions. And you also see on the right hand side of the screen, um, there's a poll there. And I encourage you to um, submit your questions in the poll during this uh, live stream. And that way I can tailor the information to you know, what most folks are looking for. And again, I really just encourage you to uh, submit your questions. Now, the replay is also going to be here for you that you can check back anytime. It's going to be a lot of information presented here, and, uh, and you want to be able to access that in the future uh, when you need to or when you need to share it with uh, some of your friends. Um, in the description down below, there's going to be links to a lot of the, uh, the videos, the support videos that I talk about during this live stream, and there's a ton of information there. And by the way, whether this is your first time watching or uh, my live stream or if you've participated in others, when you submit your, your questions or comments, please tell me where you're from. We usually get folks from all across North America and often across the pond from England and Ireland too. So you're definitely all welcome and please submit your questions. Um, uh, so, uh, by the way, the uh, installation tips and tricks we're talking about here, it says uh, the title of this uh, live stream is Water Softener Installation Tips and Tricks, but the same um, items that we talk about here today are going to apply to iron filters, sulfur filters, tannin filters, backwashable carbon filters, the whole gamut of, of products. The information is pretty much the same, where, it's, uh, where I have unique information uh, toward an iron filter or sulfur filter or a certain kind of filtration, I'll mention it. But uh, when I say the word water softener throughout this um, presentation, that's really what I'm referring to. So uh, great, I see some people have already signed up for the poll. We've had a few votes already. And again, keep voting because uh, that's the information we need uh, during this poll. And uh, where's the poll? Well, I'll show you right here. So you can see it on the right hand side of your screen there. And uh, it shows up a little bit small here, but if I look uh, here. So these are the questions that we're asking. Um, what kind of information are you looking for about installing uh, water softeners? Is it uh, where to install them? How to connect to plumbing? Uh, the programming that's involved? And putting the water softener into service. So, um, so again, that's uh, some of the information we're going to be covering here today. And um, uh, so um, when you have your questions ready, I'm going to flash them up on the screen, just like this one here. So this is uh, something I submitted a little bit earlier, and uh, so that um, we can see your question, and like I say, we can answer them live here on uh, on YouTube. So. Um, one thing, when it comes to doing water software installation, if you're not 100% sure how it works, I definitely suggest you check out my video. And again, I've got a link to that in the uh, description down below on how a water softener works. That'll definitely clear up a lot of the, the peculiarities as you're going along. And uh, so when we're talking about uh, d uh, disasters, the biggest thing uh, right from the beginning, we need to think about how to avoid some of the disasters. So some of the uh, ways that you can avoid disasters is by steering clear of those big box store water softeners. Um, I come across them all the time. Uh, life expectancy is anywhere from zero to three years. Yet we had, we've had a couple now that were installed and they literally didn't work right out of the box. And uh, so again, 
it becomes expensive when a customer asks us to install a, a water softener for them, a big box store water softener, and it doesn't work, then it becomes expensive that we have to remove it, it has to go back to the store, have to get a new one, reinstall it. So uh, definitely think twice about going for those big box store uh, water softeners. And if you're interested in the water softeners that we carry or want to check out our websites, you can go to our websites, either watereastore.com in the United States or watereastore.ca in Canada. We offer free shipping and discount pricing in each of those uh, countries. So definitely uh, check that out. And uh, let's go back to here. Whoops. Here. All right. Great. And uh, so when it talks about uh, what kind of brands we handle, we handle the, the Hume is our own private label brand. And the Hue brand features the great Clack WS1 water softener uh, valve. And, uh, and that's what our, so all of the products we're talking about here today, whether iron filters or um, water softeners, tannin filters, whatever, um, we're, we're going to be talking about. They all have the Clack WS1 valve. I mean, if you have something different, the information would apply, but specifically we're talking about that valve. And, uh, and if you're not sure about some of the parts where, as I, as I go through the presentation today, um, you know, these are the basic parts of a water softener. The, let me just flip over here. So the part at the top is the valve. This is the media tank. The tank where the salt goes is the brine tank. The stuff that's inside the media tank is the media. And, uh, and when we get to the brine tank, we'll talk about the parts of that in a little bit more detail. But um, all right, let's uh, keep on going here. So um, waiting for your questions. I haven't seen any questions show up yet, which I think is kind of odd. But um, oh, OK, uh, I, actually, I apologize. I do have one question showed up already here. And uh, I have it here from Zach. Oh, send. Welcome, Zach. I have an iron filter is not working fleck. Um, so we need a little bit more information than that to help you uh, problem solve um, why it's not working. I do have a great, uh, a great series of troubleshooting videos. Um, Zach, if you want to um, uh, either send us an email. What's our email address? I have it here. Our email is info at watereastore.com, whether you're in the US or Canada, it's the same, um, it's the same email address, but uh, you can uh, send us an email and I can suggest some videos for you to check out to do some troubleshooting to see what's going wrong with your iron filter. Difficult to troubleshoot over through a live stream. So, uh, all right. So let's go on to here and great. So, um, uh, so again, please submit your questions. I'd love to answer them live for you here during our live stream. And uh, okay, so disaster number one. And uh, so this is the one that I already talked about uh, just a few seconds ago, and that is the big box store water softeners. Uh, you know, people ask them, ask us if we'll install them for them. We do, but like I say, we've seen a lot of disasters with these. I've seen them self-installed. We've installed them. We've seen uh, problems with them. Um, sometimes they work. Um, Typically, you only get a few years out of them, but uh, but of course the problem is you buy them. Sure, they'll give you your money back, but now you've got to disconnect it. You've got to pump all the water out of it so you can get it out of your uh, back into your vehicle, take it back to the store, exchange it, and go from there. You know they've got a one eight hundred number, yeah. But what they typically do is if you have a problem with it, they'll try to troubleshoot it and they'll just send you parts and they'll just keep sending you parts, hoping that something's going to stick, right? And uh, but then eventually you have to uh, replace it, so it's a pain. All right, so uh, water softener choice, making sure you get the correct size water softener. This is another one that I see all, all too often. You want to make sure that it's not too small, that it's going to be able to handle uh, the amount of water your family uses and the hardness of your water. But you also want to make sure that uh, it's not too big. And uh, I see this... Um, uh, a lot of the times. So again, I've got a great YouTube video that goes into more detail on sizing your water softener. And again, there's a link in the description down below. Definitely encourage you to uh, to check that out. And um, so, uh, so <laughs> another disaster I've seen. We have we're a uh, hundred miles north of Toronto here in Ontario, 
in Canada, and um, and uh, we're in cottage country. So an area not too far from us is uh, the Muskoka's areas, and there's a lot of very expensive um, cottages built basically with a blank check. So what happens is the often the contractor and the plumbing supplier and that put in these huge water filtration systems. Well, what happens is the people that use these um, these cottages. Yeah, they have big parties and they might have 40, 50 or 60 or more people there at a time, but a lot of the time it's just two people there. So this, these huge water softeners are overkill, huge tannin filters, that kind of thing. And what happens, they don't last very long because they don't regenerate often enough, they don't get the care they need, and then they need to be replaced just because of lack of use. So it's important that, that you make sure it gets sized correctly. And if you have any questions about that, uh, definitely submit that into the comments. Um, so uh, another disaster uh, is that a family chose to have a water softener and they were on a pretty tight budget. So what happened was uh, they really wanted to go with the smallest water softener they possibly could. Now they were in an area that had very hard water. The hardness was, I don't know, 25, 28 grains per gallon, something like that, but there was only two of them. So they got by with a 22,000 grain water softener. So that's what they went with. Well, guess what happened? Six months later, their son, his wife and their two kids moved in. So now they had a family of six there. There's no way that water softener kept up with it. So again, the sizing is important. You need to have that safety factor built in where it's uh, good for four to five days of use that it regenerates after every four to five days. And, uh, and that's, where, um, that's where the sweet spot is from sizing. So again, check out that video I have uh, down below about sizing. Where is the water softener installed? So basically equipment is installed after the main water shut off. Um, so if you're on a municipal water supply after your meter, but before the water splits into hot and cold, so it does all the water in the whole house. Now, if you have outside uh, taps that you want to have untreated, uh, because you're using it to water the lawn, or you've got an irrigation system or something like that, that water line comes off before the water softener. Um, uh, if you're on a, a, a well or you're on surface water, like from a lake or something like that, then it needs to be connected after the pressure tank, but again, before the water splits into hot and cold. And keep in mind any lines that you may want to be bypassing, maybe for a bunkie or um, like I say, an irrigation system, boathouse, you know, something like that. So keep that in mind. And um, all right. And uh, so disaster number four, uh, water softener was pre-sold without checking the installation area, which had very little space. So uh, we got some clowns around here that'll basically sell you a water softener without doing any testing, without asking for any information, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, they bas you basically phone them up, you want a water softener? Yeah, we send one over and uh, they'll send over an installer that unfortunately has no information ahead of time and they show up and they find they can't get access to the water line just because of the additions that were put on this place or whatever, who knows what went on. And then what happens is they can't get access. Well, they were sent here to install a water softener. So typically what they'll do is they'll just cut the line before the hot water heater, install it on the hot water heater, and that's it. Well, the customer was expecting softened water everywhere. So after they call that guy back a few times, he doesn't answer their calls anymore. They'll call me and they'll say, how come this water softener is brand new? I'm not getting soft water. And then we find out it's only hooked up to the hot water. So that has to be checked out. So again, you need to check it out uh, beforehand before you invest. All right, uh, where you actually locate the water softener matters. So um, you need to make sure that's a nice, clean, flat surface. So again, in cottage country, sometimes we have, you know, uh, crawl spaces or basements that are kind of rocky or uneven. And uh, so it's best to have a nice, clean, flat surface. Um, if it's a crawl space, you need to think about that. If you're gonna be um, dragging those bags of salt all the way across the basement um, to put in the, the water softener because you installed the water softener right beside the pressure tank, it might make more sense to move the, the, the water softener, or at the very least, the brine tank closer to the opening for the crawl space so you don't have to travel as far before you add the salt. The other thing you need to think about is how tall the crawl space is and make sure you've got enough room above the top of the brine tank to be able to get the salt in there. And uh, so these are all things you need to think about a little bit before you actually do the installation. Um, you also need to think about in the winter time, if this is a cottage or a cabin or a seasonal kind of place, if you're going to be draining it in the, in the winter time because you're not going to have the heat on, how are you going to do that? How are you going to drain it? And, uh, and like I say, make sure you, you, you think about that before you actually decide where you're going to install the equipment. 
Um, so disaster number five is uh, we had a situation where the brine tank was installed in, it was a beautiful huge uh, home, but the, the crawl space where the equipment was installed was very dirty. And, uh, and actually the brine tank ended up sitting right on top of a very small nail. So once the salt went in there, the water went into the brine tank, the weight of it co compressed. And after, I think it was a year, year and a half, it, that, that nail actually cracked the bottom of the brine tank. And then we started getting these salty stains all around the bottom of the brine tank and it was damp all the time. And sure enough, what happened was it was leaking. So, so make sure you've got a nice flat surface that you can put it on. Another one that I've seen is again, what I talked about just a few minutes ago, was where the, the lid of the brine tank was just, just inches below the floor joist. Well, it was almost impossible to get the salt in there. And so that should have been thought out better. So what could you be done about that? Well, um, we, in the past, what we've done is we've actually put the brine tank on the main floor even though the water softener was in the crawl space. So it can go in the, in the closet or something like that. So you can fill up the, the salt it, it up on the main floor in the brine tank, but you don't have to worry about the, the, um, the water softener actually being in the basement. And that was a really good solution. It was actually for some older folks and uh, it, it, uh, it made it a lot handier for them. All right. Uh... So uh, last year, um, you folks in Texas had a freeze and a lot of, we had a lot of customers in the Texas area that had to replace the, uh, the media tanks on their water softeners because they actually split and because they froze. And uh, so they had a lot of damage. So you need to think about that. I mean, that was a very unusual situation but you need to kind of keep that in mind. It was uh, very aggravating for a lot of the folks in a lot of our customers in Texas. So, so what's the order that the equipment goes in? Well, again, if you're on a municipal or a city uh, water, um, water supply, then typically um, it would be chlorinated water supply. So it's always best to remove the chlorine before the water softener. So you can have an automatic backwashing uh, carbon filter to remove the chlorine before it goes into the water softener. Um, or you can put a, a 20 inch big blue carbon filter in there before the water softener to remove that chlorine. The chlorine will definitely shorten the life of the, the media inside the water softener. Um, how much chlorine you have, how much water you use is going to determine all that. It, it's a long term thing, it's not going to happen right away, but it's something to keep in mind. So. After your shutoff, you would have the, the carbon filter to remove the, the chemicals in your water. Then you'd have the water softener and then it goes on to your whole house. Um, if you're on a well water system, then there's more information depending on what your water is like. If you, have, um, if you have a lot of sediment in your water and you've got an automatic backwashing filter, then um, you're going to want to have that first. Or if you've got a spin down filter, something like that, you're going to have that first to, get, to do the heavy lifting to get rid of all the dirt. Then you would go into your iron filter. If you have an iron filter, if you have iron in your water or sulfur in your water, then you're gonna go, wanna go into your water softener. And then after the water softener, you would go into your tannin filter if you have tannins in the water, uh, um, or it, ultraviolet light, pre-filter from ultraviolet, that kind of thing. So that's where the, the water softener sits in terms of the, uh, the order of the equipment. So it's definitely something to uh, keep in mind when you're planning your installation. And that's kind of what we're talking about this stage is the planning process. Very important. So disaster number nine, uh, ultraviolet system dis d installed before the water softener. So sometimes what we see, especially here in cottage country, is a customer will decide, oh, I want to have a water softener installed. And then after a while, they'll say, oh, I want to have an ultraviolet disinfection system installed. And they'll have that installed and then have that installed. But if, if there isn't a water filtration specialist or someone that really knows what order the equipment goes in, typically um, someone might go in, a plumber might go in that's not very familiar with the order of water filtration equipment, and they just put it where they think it should go, but not necessarily. So if the ultraviolet system goes before the water softener, then what happens is that sleeve in the ultraviolet system is going to become coated with a lime scale, the light isn't going to be able to shine through to kill the bacteria, and then it's not going to work. So it's even worse than not having one, because now you've got a false sense of security for that ultraviolet disinfection system. Same with the... Uh, um, uh, iron filter. It's the same kind of scenario with that. So keep that in mind in terms of the order of the equipment. If you have any questions, like I say, uh, just uh, s send us an email or put a comment at the bottom of this video. Let's see if we've got some more questions coming in here. 
Well, we could, we got another one. I was hoping for a little bit more, but uh, Dzorba 68. How do you know when it's time to retire your water softener? Mine is 17 years old, but the water is still soft. You know, and that's a great question. When the time is when it stops working. Uh, I mean. I know that sounds overly obvious, but you know, I've seen water softeners, uh, like I say, last zero years, that's very uncommon. But generally speaking, most um, made in North America, non big box store water softeners are typically going to last from 10 to 15 years. I mean, our, our clock valve water softeners, I mean, we're coming in next year is, uh, or next month is going to be my 20 year anniversary in this industry. I've been selling these uh, clock um, water softeners for 20 years. We've had great, great service from them. We've only replaced a, a handful of the ones that we installed 20 years ago for various reasons, but, um, but they're super reliable. I think they're going to go 25 years. I've seen some of the Aquamaster and Water Boss water softeners go 25 years. So it really depends on your situation. Again, we talked about chlorine. If you're on a chlorinated water supply and you've done, and you don't have anything to remove the chlorine, you don't have a carbon filter, it probably isn't going to last that long, maybe 12 or 15 years. If you've got a lot of iron in your water and you don't have an iron filter to get rid of it before the water softener, that's definitely going to short, shorten the life expectancy of the media inside the water softener. So, um, you know, so it really depends. If you start to notice some symptoms, then um, I have some great troubleshooting videos. Definitely troubleshoot the water softener first. It might just be a dirty injector or something like that is causing it not to work. But if you've gone through the troubleshooting and you still can't get the water softener to work, that's the time. But thanks for your question. I appreciate that. All right. Great. Um, let's keep on going and let's keep those questions coming. And again, I encourage you to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Folks like to hear that. Um, oh, disaster number 10. So this is one of those ones that Gary caused. And uh, went out to see some folks. Uh, we installed a water softener for them. It was installed in an area of their home that a uh, utility room but it was only two people. They mostly lived upstairs and they didn't go into this utility room very often. So it, that's where the plumbing was. That's where it made sense to install it. I saw an electrical outlet there. I plugged in a lamp just to make sure it was working. Everything was working. Great. That was fine. So I got called back a few months later. They said, water softer's heart is, isn't using any salt at all. Uh, they've never heard it regenerate. Doesn't seem to be working. What's going on? So I went down and I looked and I looked and I looked, tried to figure it out. Couldn't figure out what was wrong. And, uh, and then I uh, turned off the light and I started to leave and I realized the water softener also went off. It was plugged into a switched outlet. <laughs> so what happened is every time they shut off the light, uh, that also shut off the water softener had no power. So of course, 99% of the time they weren't down there, the lights were off, so was the water softener. So make sure you check that wherever you're plugging your water softener into, it isn't a switched uh, uh, outlet. All right. Um, okay, so in terms of connecting the water softener to the plumbing, the first thing you need to know is what size plumbing you have, okay? So if you've got uh, three quarter inch uh, copper plumbing or whatever, uh, all of our water softeners ship with uh, three quarter inch um, installation kits. So you're just going directly into that. Now, if your plumbing is half inch, then you just use a reducer and uh, I guess an increaser, if you like, from half inch up to the three quarter inch. Now, but if your plumbing is one inch, then um, when you're ordering your water softener from us, please specify that you've got one inch plumbing and, uh, and we'll send a one inch tail kit because these water softeners can handle one inch plumbing no problem. But if you take that one inch plumbing down to three quarters of an inch going into the water softener and then back out of it, back up to one inch, you're gonna reduce the flow in the household. And likely if you've got one inch plumbing, there's a reason for it. And that is you've probably got several bathrooms, you've got several pl different places where the water's being used. And because of that, you, you might have high water flow. Maybe you've got two or three people having showers and different showers at a time. Uh, that kind of thing going on and you don't want to increase the flow and if you went from one inch down to three quarters and back up to one inch you definitely decrease the flow so definitely keep that in mind um, find out what size your plumbing is uh, before you order your water softener and keep that in mind if you've already purchased it and uh, so um, there's different kinds of plumbing connections let me just uh, move on here and uh, yeah, so when you're doing the connection, so let me just show you what we have here. All right, so this is this is a common tail kit. And uh, so how the tail kit comes, it comes as a kit. And uh, so these are the ones we ship by default. It's called a three quarter inch sweat tail kit. 
and it doesn't come with this pipe <laughs> just so you know okay it comes with these fittings okay and then so you need to have some three quarter inch copper you need to sweat it onto the fitting and then put this um this ring on and then this o-ring and this goes on too okay now if you want to switch it over to pex then you can just switch uh put a fitting on the end like this oops doesn't want to focus there you can see it there um, you can sweat a, a, a PEX fitting on the end like that to convert it over. So that's one option that you have and um, to connect it. Now, you, we also have solder-free options, and, uh, and those ones have become more popular. In fact, I just did a video recently about that. So we have them set up like this. So this is a solder-free option. So you can see here we're using copper. And uh, so these are the John Guest um, fittings on here. We also have... Shark bite, shark bite fittings. These ones are, are here, and uh, so um, I've got a great, uh, like I say, a great video that talks about how to how to use these fittings and how to connect without solder. And here, so there's the thumbnail for the video. So I uh, again, I've got uh, in the description down below, I've got links to that video. So if that's what you're looking for, that's fine. Um, again, if you're ordering um, from us then make sure you specify that you're looking for the shark bite fittings or you're looking for the John Guest fittings or whatever. If you specify that when you order, we'll include them at no additional cost. So uh, keep that in mind if you're planning to do a solder-free uh, installation. Okay, so be sure you know how to use the type of plumbing you're, use, you're, you're connecting to. So many years ago, we had an installer, I guess it's got to be about 15 years ago, and, uh, and he was, had, had been used to using copper before, had, done, had been in this industry for a long time, and it was the first time he was confronted with PEX. So, I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, so this is PEX here. We'll focus on that. Yes, it will. Okay, that's PEX pipe. And then this is the fitting for the PEX. Focus. Yes, yes. Okay. So how these things work is there's a, a ring. You slide that on there. You slide it an eighth of an inch of the PEX. He still needs to be protruding. You put the fitting in. And he thought he was done. <laughs> but he's not done. Because what you need to do is you need to use a crimping tool like this baby here. Sorry about the rust in that. And uh, and you need to crimp that fitting on there. Well, he didn't do that. And I don't know how he got out of the house not doing that. But anyway, the first time it regenerated, it made a heck of a mess. And it scared the poor uh, lady that was there. So make sure you know whatever kind of, uh, of uh, materials, whatever kind of plumbing you're connected to, make sure how to use it. Uh, I'm not going into great length about all the different, whether it's PEX, whether it's CPVC, whether it's copper, whether it's braided poly, whatever. I'm not going through a great uh, deal uh, um, detail this evening and all that. You need to know that uh, before you, you do that. So I got, um, after the last live stream I did a month ago, um, I got a, an email from someone, that Josh, that was watching that live stream, and, uh, and he had uh, uh, some very good comments. And one of the comments was, keep in mind that if you're using PEX, that the inside diameter, let me see if we can do this. Will it focus? Yes. Okay. So you can see, in the, this is um, half-inch copper, and this is half-inch PEX. So you see the inside diameter, how much smaller it is on the PEX? So just be careful. If you ha don't have a particularly good flow in your household, um, if, you go, if you're already on half-inch plumbing and you change it over to half-inch PEX, you're going to slow down that flow even more. So you may want to take that half-inch copper and move it up to three-quarter inch PEX so that you get the larger inside diameter to, to uh, maintain that flow or continue to do it in copper. If, if, you know, if you're not uh, comfortably working with copper, then you can always uh, go with uh, um, a plumber and ask a plumber. I see some more questions coming in and uh, that's great. So let's see uh, what you got here, guys. Okay, great. Uh, this one. Got a question here from Rich. I have a question on swapping a tank from a 9x48 to a 13x54. What all do I need to change on my uh, Clack WS1? Um, you need to change the injector because the injectors are based on the tank size. I'm assuming you're, you're going to use the same amount of media 
uh, you said a nine by 48. So that's probably uh, one cubic feet of uh, media. So, but if you're gonna to go to 13 by 54, and maybe you're going to 13 by 54 because you wanna increase, go from a 30,000 grain to a 45,000 grain, one and a half cubic feet, or go to a 60,000 grain, two cubic feet, you might be okay 13 by 54, two cubic feet then you're also gonna change the programming because the valve doesn't know what size, how, much, how many grains per gallon, or sorry, how many cubic feet of media you have in the tank unless you tell it. So um, I, I'm gonna be going into programming a little bit later in this live stream, but I do have a link in the description down below that takes you right through the programming. I did another live stream on that uh, some months ago and, and it shows in there exactly where you'd have to change the setting. But that's a great question. You can't just go changing the tanks, screw off the, the valve off one tank, screw it onto another tank, and away you go. There's more involved to it than that. So like I say, number one, the injector. Number two, um, the programming. And that's pretty much it. All right, great. Thank you for that question. We've got more coming here. SNJ Property Services, welcome. How often do you recommend testing water for hardness level? You know, that's a great question. Um, generally speaking, I recommend that, um, you know, if the homeowner notices something wrong, something different, um, you know, often uh, the wife of the family may say, hey, you know, the, I'm getting staining, the, the dishes have water spots on them, the glass shower doors are getting streaks on the bottom, something's wrong. That's definitely the time to, uh, to test it. Other than that, you really don't need to test it unless you want to. I mean, we have a local store here, so people bring in uh, water uh, samples to us all the time. We test it for free. So, you know, if you want to test it, you know, I mean, obviously, if you're doing some troubleshooting because something doesn't seem right, maybe your water software stopped using salt, um, you know, something like that's going on, then, yeah, that would definitely be the time. But other than that, you really don't need to unless you start seeing some symptoms. But thanks. That was a great question. And... Uh... Question from Joe, have a Clack WS1 head for my water softener. Great, Joe. Um, like I say, the Clack WS1 is definitely the premier um, valve uh, out there. Um, I see it being used all the time. They're changing up the faceplate a little bit so that uh, some people can uh, use it for their own private label brand. And uh, But it's uh, still a great product. Um, Rich is asking me, also, what size drain DLFC, which means drain line flow control, do I need uh, for the drain line? I don't know. Um, that's something you uh, I just don't know off by heart. And uh, so if you like, what you can do is uh, send me an email. Uh, where is my email information? Right here. Send me an email, uh, info at wateristore.com. And, uh, and what we can do is I can uh, check that out for you. And... Uh, and uh, make a recommendation for you um, uh, what you would need for that. I don't, like I say, I don't know that off, off by hand. So, uh, but thanks for the question. And we have a question here from Tim. I placed my order for a new water softener system, but I'm curious, does it arrive with the resin in the cylinder and the valve already installed? Great question, Tim. If you ordered it from me, yes, it does. Um, the only time it doesn't is when it starts getting into the really big water softeners like 60,000, 75,000, or 90,000. Then we have to ship the media separately. But our water softeners um, come with the media installed, with the valve uh, already programmed um, to be a water softener for that size media, all set to go. Actually, all of our products come that way, uh, be it the iron filters, be it the tannin filters, they all come pre-programmed. All you need to do is set your hardness, set the current time and the regen time, and you're good to go. So, uh, great question. Thanks, Tim. I hope you ordered it from me. <laughs> all right. Uh, another question from Joe. Four years old. Have recently cleaned the whole system per your videos. Get a churning on... Uh, sorry... Joe, get a churning on the left side of the screen. What does this indicate? A churning. I'm not sure what you mean by a churning. Do you mean something's flashing on the left side of the screen? Uh, the word softening flashes when water's flowing through the valve to indicate that the, the flow meter's working. I don't know if that's what you mean, but... Uh, um, another question here. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but... Uh, uh, I guess you're just identifying yourself. Thanks for watching. Appreciate uh, you watching. Uh, 
Oh, well, that was Joe's question. Um, I have a question here from BB. Hello, have the new RO system uh, worked great? 500 parts per million to 10 parts per million. Oh, that's great. Uh, lasted a month, then filters clogged and went to 160 parts per million. Just a second here. Let me show that one again. Filters clogged went to 160 parts per million and made very little water. How can I get my filters to last longer? Um, okay, so you have a, a new RO system that uh, the filters are clogging. Well, the first filter on an RO system is a 5 micron filter, which is a fairly fine filter. So if you don't have any other filters on your house or you've got hard water, um, that 5 micron filter and that membrane of the reverse osmosis system is going to try to do all the filtering and it will clog prematurely. So you probably already having uh, other concerns in the house with maybe the screen clogging up to your washing machine or something like that. And uh, so that's something uh, you should consider uh, getting a whole house um, sediment filter, uh, polypropylene sediment filter, something like that. Something coarser than 5 microns, maybe 25 microns, or getting a dual gradient filter, 75 microns on the outside, 25 microns on the inside, to do the heavy lifting before it gets to your reverse osmosis system. That's definitely what I'd uh, suggest you look at. And I got rich. The continuation. I was going to 2.5 cubic feet of media. I'm looking for more, more of the mechanical uh, pieces. Do I need to change? Um, uh, like I say, uh, Rich, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think there's a whole lot of mechanical other pieces you need to change. Like as you mentioned, the drain line flow control may need to be changed. I'd have to investigate that. But the injector. And the um, uh, and the programming, of course. So, uh, uh, question here: uh, Do you recommend using Iron Out to clean the brine tank as a maintenance? Yeah, I think Iron Out is a great product to use, um, specifically if you're on well water. Uh, it's it's a great uh, if you have some iron in your well water or and, and if you already know you have iron and your water softener is dealing with the iron and softening the water then definitely um, iron out's a good product to use if you're on a municipal system and there's no iron in the water I would say ResCare is a better product to use and um, so uh, we have that on our website I don't have a link to it in the description down below but uh, if you're looking for it uh, just uh, put it in the comments uh, after we finish this live stream and I can definitely uh, give you a link. Great, thanks for these questions. I, uh, I appreciate them. And uh, Oh, Joe is asking, um, what does the turning asterisk on the left side of the screen mean? Um, Joe, did you say, what, what make was your water softener? Uh, scrolling down here. So, yeah, you said you had a clack head on your water softener. I've never seen a churning asterisk. So you must mean that it's somewhere up over here. I've never seen a churning asterisk on a clack valve. Are you sure it's a clack valve? Um, I did a video on how to identify it's a, uh, a clack valve uh, when I did my programming videos. So again, there's a link to that down below. So you may want to check that out just to make sure it's a clack valve. I have seen some other valves that do have churning, but they're definitely not clack valves. So clack valves say softening when the water is uh, going so um, uh, I've got L oh thanks Gary for providing such helpful and unbiased information can you talk about salt options rock salt versus uh, pellets yeah welcome L uh, welcome back uh, to this live stream yeah so that's a great question so um, some manufacturers out there recommend um, uh, rock salt, I have no idea why. Pellets are much better, they're much cleaner. Because the problem is, if you look at a water software that's been installed a number of years where they've been using pellets, or sorry, rock salt, you can tell. Because when that salt level gets down very low in the brine tank, there's dirt left in there, and I mean downright mud. And uh, and then when you the water softener, uh, you start having difficulties with the water after the water softener after a few years, it's just not working. It's just not drawing the brine. You go to clean the injector. There's actually mud in that injector. So that's why I definitely don't recommend rock salt. Yeah, pellets are a little bit more money than rock salt, but they're clean. You know, I've used uh, my water softener at my last house um, was uh, 15 years old before we moved. And, uh, and I let it run out of salt 
uh, maybe once a year or once every two years and there was nothing at the bottom there was no dirt there was nothing because of the pellets are so clean and the chances of them clogging getting that salt clog are so much less mind you the chances of the rock salt clogging are very low too as opposed to using potassium um, chloride instead of uh, salt sodium chloride uh, that stuff clogs super easily and uh, same with crystal salt I don't like crystal salt as opposed to the pellets. Crystal salt also clogs very readily. But great question, Al, thank you. Uh, what else we got here? Um, if the asterisk indicates it's working, it's a good thing. Well, again, assuming this asterisk that you're seeing is, is part of the flow meter, that means water's flowing through and it's metering and it's working correctly, yes. And that's what I say what the clock valves do. They have the words uh, softening flashing. And, um, Here's a great question by Sean. How do you feel about upflow versus downflow? Pros and cons of both. Um, great question. So uh, what is uh, Sean asking about here? So a downflow water softener is when the, when the water's going, uh, when the, it's softening the water, the water's flowing down through the water softener and upflow is it goes down to the bottom um, first and then goes up through the media. So the advantage of downflow, they say the disadvantages of downflow is that um, it doesn't use all of the media because it starts off wide at the top and then it gets narrow at the bottom where the, scre the screen is where the water goes in. Um, the people that like the upflow, they say it works out better because water goes down through the bottom and then it comes up through the media and it uses all of the media to do the softening of the water. Um, the problem with um, upflow water softeners is generally they're set up where um, it starts its regeneration cycle. It, it does uh, what's called pre-fill. In other words, there's no water in the brine tank. So what happens is when it starts its cycle, it puts water in the brine tank. It pauses for four hours. So it has time, theoretically, time enough for that water to absorb the salt and then for it to go through its uh, cycle. The problem I have with those as a few problems with them. Um, first of all, is four hours enough time to fully um, absorb the salt? It really isn't. And uh, so because of that, you tend to um, you tend to have to compensate for it in the hardness settings. So, so that part I don't like. The other part I don't like is you don't know how much salt you should have in there. So often I see people, they put far too little salt in there because they may only have three or four inches of salt in there. They think that's enough. But when it goes through its pre-fill cycle and it puts the salt in or the water in there to absorb the salt, well, there's eight or 10 inches of water above the salt that isn't absorbing the salt at all. So it's not getting the right concentration of sodium in the water. So it can't fully regenerate the, the, the brine tank. And um, generally speaking, I see um, upflow water softeners uh, being sold in places, places like big box stores, places um, like that, where they don't, they don't want to have any callbacks. They don't want to have, you know, any salt clogging problems. And, uh, and, you know, with just a little bit of maintenance and maintaining the salt level properly, then you'll eliminate all of that anyway. And it's super easy to do. I just find that the water softeners work better, last longer, uh, downflow. And um, that's my preference. All the water softeners we sell are downflow, except for our high efficiency ones. Our Aquamaster and Water Boss water softeners are uh, upflow. I guess that's where the high efficiency side of it comes in. But um, all of our Clackveld, our Hume water filtration um, water softeners are all um, are all um, downflow. But thanks for the questions and keep them coming. And uh... oh, and by the way, if you're not already a subscriber, please subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate it. that way you get notified about all the new live streams that are coming up and uh, and all the different uh, and as the new videos become available each week you'll also be notified of that so that's great i have a question here from evan holmes do you recommend the automatic res care feeder uh, hi evan um i i don't and the reason is i just find they're super problematic either you get too much flowing out of it or not enough i just prefer that depending on your situation if you don't have a lot of iron uh, in it you know once a year half a cup um, pour it in and let the water so pour it into the brine well. 
you know, the, the tube inside the brine tank and then uh, put the water softener through a cycle. That's a far better way to do it than, uh, than having that drip, drip, drip. And it makes such a mess in the brine tank. And then if, if you want to, you know, if you find that you're getting a salt clog and you want to dig it out, oh man, what a mess it is in there. And I just find it wastes a lot of the, the res care. Um, you know, I, I just personally, I think they invented it so you'd use more. Uh, res care. I really think that's what it is. But thanks for the question, Evan. Um, I guess someone's, I'm sorry, I don't know what that meant. All right. Tim, you sent me a very detailed response to my email, which resulted, oh, sorry, it was quick, it resulted in me ordering a system for me. Oh, you're, you're welcome, Tim. And uh, that's a great point, Tim. I mean, I get, you wouldn't believe how many emails I get every day. People asking me questions, asking me problem solving, troubleshooting, making sec uh, recommendations and things like that. And that's what we do here. We help out folks uh, coast to coast in uh, Canada and the U.S. on their, their water filtration needs and uh, helping them troubleshoot, making recommendations on what would work best for them. And, uh, and I always encourage you to get a water test before, or if not, you can always mail us a, a water sample. We'll test it for you. We don't charge for that. And uh, great. So thanks a lot for those questions. That was great. Let me get on with the presentation. And uh, ah, you know what? Um, I have exciting news. And, uh, and the exciting news is that, um, so we hit 8 million views. And, uh, and that's great. I mean, that means uh, somewhere along the line, 8 million people have clicked on one of my videos and have watched the video. And, uh, and that's great. That was really exciting to me. But what's even more exciting than the 8 million views is the 30,000 subscribers. So that means 30,000 people, maybe like you, have uh, chosen to sus subscribe to my YouTube channel, which means we have more subscribers than uh, any other water filtration YouTube channel in North America. And that's phenomenal. In fact, I think we're, we're double than the next guy. So, uh, and that really shows that, uh, you know, you folks are interested in the, in the, um, in the material and in the, the information that I supply to you. And, and that's great. I really appreciate that. So, uh, all right, great. Let's uh, keep moving here and we'll get back to some more questions in just a little bit, but please keep those questions uh, coming. And, uh, so drain connections secured at both ends. So this is something that I'd like to talk about here. And uh, so this, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to take this off here. <clears throat> so from Clack, this comes with a different fitting on here. Okay, it comes with a black fitting. And, um, and it's a compression fitting. And you just shove the drain line inside. It has a little uh, fitting that goes inside. You shove it in here, and then you just tighten it up, and that holds it in place. Now, for a water softener, that works great. But I don't recommend that fitting uh, when you're using for an air over media iron and sulfur filter, because what happens is they have built up air inside here. It's actually compressed air inside here. And when it starts this regeneration cycle, it pushes the water out fast. So what I recommend is you do something like what I've done here. And that is, that's a three quarter inch um, FPT fitting, female pipe thread fitting, and it goes to half inch PEX. And, uh, and you can see it's got a proper ring on there. So uh, definitely I encourage you to do that. And the other thing is, again, with a water softener, not so important, but definitely with an air over media iron and sulfur filter, the other end of the drain line has to be secured. You can't just run it into a drain stack or you can't just um, uh, shove it down, like I say, into a drain stack or just drape it into a laundry sink or something like that. You can't because when it starts that backwash cycle, the first five or six seconds, it's releasing that air and that thing's snaking around. It's flopping all around and it can actually fly right out. So, um, so definitely uh, keep that in mind when installing, um, uh, like I say, more of the FOB, FOC, FOK, iron and sulfur filters. Not so much a concern with the water softeners, but I would def uh, definitely um, make sure your drain line secured at both ends. And that leads to, leads us to disaster number 12, drain lines on water softeners and especially FOBs. And uh, so we've, I've seen that happen where um, the other end of the drain line was shoved down into a drain stack and uh, over a period of time, it kind of came loose, came loose and it actually flipped right out and uh, discharged all over the floor. Luckily it was a basement. Luckily I didn't do it, but, um, but I've seen that happen. So make sure you secure it at both ends, very important. Um, 
Yeah, so we talked about the, the fitting and, uh, all right, and uh, great. So I see we're getting some more questions. Great, keep them coming and let's see what you folks got. Um, yeah, Joe, definitely a CLAC WS1. Asterix must mean it's working. We'll try to send the picture. Yeah, please do. Uh, I, like I said, I've never seen that before, and uh, but that would be great if you could send the picture. I'd love to see it. All right. Um, Tim, what you got? Congratulations, because watching your videos, it's easy to understand why you have a lot of viewers. Well, thanks, Tim. Um, you're very honest and very, very knowledgeable. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, and I appreciate that, uh, that you've noticed that. That's how we've built our business. I've been in this business, water filtration, for 20 years, and... Uh, and uh, we've been online, I guess now seven or eight years, and uh, and I find that it was needed in the industry. It was needed to have someone that uh, would speak honestly and openly. If I like something, I'll tell you. If I don't like something, I'll tell you too. And it's just it's totally based on my experience. It's not based on uh, me trying to sell you the most expensive stuff out there because you'll find a lot of the stuff uh, isn't the most expensive, like our Hume brand of uh, water filtration products. They're definitely not the most expensive out there, but they're the best out there. And, uh, but uh, thanks for that comment, Tim. And see what else we got here. Joe, how do you tell when your resin and water softener needs to be replaced? Well, great question. So you've, so you've gone through the troubleshooting so again, I've got a great troubleshooting video. I've got a link to the description down below. You've gone through the troubleshooting. It's still using salt. Um, it's, it's doing everything as it did before, but the water's hard. It's not soft anymore. Then uh, the resin's worn out. Or the other thing is that the water softener slowed down the flow. And I would say we replace resin most often because of that. Now, maybe if you're on a chlorinated water supply, it'll actually break down the, the resin beads inside and they, they clump up together and they'll actually clog the water softener. It takes a long time, but it'll actually do that. So when it's a situation where you find that the water flow is very slow, coming out of the faucets, out of the shower, that kind of thing, you bypass the water softener, oh, you get a lot better flow. Well, what that tells you is the problem is within the water softener, the, the beads need to be replaced, the resin beads, because they're breaking down and they're clogging that water softener. So those are the two, two ways you know that it's time. Great question, though, Joe. Thank you. Uh, and Stephen, congrats, Gary. You're awesome and a wealth of information. Well, thanks very much, Stephen. I appreciate you mentioning that. And uh, that's what this YouTube channel is all about, is sharing information with you. What do I say at the beginning? I simplify water filtration to help you conquer crappy water. That's what we do. And uh, Sean, congrats, Gary. You do a wonderful job. How do you feel about filtration media mixed inside a water softener with regular softener media? Oh, I think what you're referring to, Sean, is uh, mixed mixed media um, mixed media um, water water softener slash tannin filters or dual use and that kind of thing. Um, in a word or in a small phrase, I don't like them because. The, the, the tannin filter slash water softener combo is, is my, I absolutely hate them. Because what happens is um, the amount of sodium you need to regenerate tannin media is much different than the amount of sodium you need to regenerate the water softener media. And a tannin media needs to be regenerated every three days. Water softener is metered and you can go up to 14 days without regenerating it. So you can see very different. So I've seen people, and it happens to me, you know, a customer needs a water softener, needs a tannin filter, they get the price for both, they go, whoa, that's a lot of money. And you're right, it is. It's a major investment in your home, cottage or cabin, and, uh, and, and they'll phone up a competitor and the competitor say, hey, no problem, I've got a, a mixed bed, water softener, tannin filter, it'll do the job for you. And you know what, they install it, it does but only for a little while. What happens is that tannin media wears out very, very quickly, sometimes with, within a year. And what that means is now you, to get it working properly the way it did before, you'd actually have to replace all the media in it, both tannin and softener, which probably cost eight or $900. So why not just do it right in the first place? And uh, I've never come across a mix. I guess the only exception would be water softeners that have carbon media in them. And again, if it's done properly, like the Aquamaster water softeners, the AMS 950, where the, the carbon will last 20 plus years, then it works. But if they just 
you know, sprinkle uh, a quarter of a cubic foot of car a quarter a cubic foot of carbon in there with the water softener resin and say that it's a it's a water softener slash chlorine removal filter and it's not going to work. In fact, I had one of those um, some years ago, 20 years ago, I guess. Now I tried it, and again, uh, the the carbon part of it only lasted a few years, and then I had to uh, replace the media again at huge cost. So that's why I don't like them. But great question. Thanks for asking. Um, Rich, what resin would you recommend? Um, I have a I have a couple of videos. One is how to replace the resin in a um, water softener. If you haven't watched it, I definitely uh, encourage you to check that out. It's on my YouTube channel, GaryTheWaterGuy.com. Um, so I got two videos on there: how to replace the resin and how to calculate how much resin you need for that water softener. And in both of those, I have links to the resin that I have on my, my website. We've got a great resin. We use it in all of our water softeners. We've used it for, like I say, 20 years. Great performance with it, moderate cost. And um, I definitely suggest you, you check that out. If you can't find it, just add a comment down below when, when this is done. And uh, when I read the comments, I'll uh, put a link to the resin there. And, uh, and a quick one here from Sean. Sean, thank you. No, I, thanks, Sean. I appreciate uh, the comment. Okay, let's move right along here. And uh, thank you for the questions. It really helps uh, the live stream if you submit your questions, and I appreciate it. Even if you're just uh, making a comment about where you're where you're from, where you're watching this from, and uh, and what you're interested in, I really appreciate that to uh, personalize it. Uh, disaster number 14. So we, I see, use the, the we, our company, connected a drain line that disappeared into the floor rafters above. So it went off into the ceiling and we couldn't really tell where it went. This place has been renovated a bunch of times and we couldn't really tell the integrity of it. We saw it at the one end where it went into the rafters and then we saw where it came out at the other end where it went to a drain stack. It was both half inch pecs, it was both half inch opaque pecs. It looked in great shape. Well, guess what? It wasn't. And um, we, uh, it was connected to a water softener, no problem at all. When we connected it to an FOB, iron and sulfur filter, it actually, one of, it was a patchwork of, of fittings that had been put together and it actually let go and it caused the flood. So, since then, we make sure that we connect, we, we follow the whole drain line, and if we are open at both ends, we actually pull out that one and put in a new one just to make sure we don't run into that situation again. It happens, that's how you learn, but that's why I'm sharing with you my disasters today so that you won't make the same disasters, and uh, hopefully you'll spread the word too so that other folks don't do them either because it's awful when that happens. Where to drain to? Okay, so there's a number of places to drain to, and this is where you have to watch out for the codes in your area. So generally speaking, the codes, uh, the, the uh, plumbing codes in your area will tell you that um, you have to have an air gap between the, the drain line, assume that this is the drain line, and it has to be one and a half diameters above the flood rim, okay, and or one and a half inches. At least that's what it is in our area here. So you have to plan for that. Now, how can you do that? Well, there's a number of ways that you can do that. Um, but to be perfectly honest, sometimes it's very difficult to do that, especially when there's very little space, there's very little options. The, the area in which the water softener is being installed um, is totally finished, finished walls, finished ceilings, that kind of thing. And sometimes there aren't a lot of options on how you can do that. So the easiest way that you can do that is you can do it to a laundry sink, right? Just run, this is the... The laundry sink, just run it like this, right? And uh, secure this, and then when it goes to the backwash, water flows into the laundry sink. Yeah, I don't like that idea either. <laughs> so one of the potential problems with doing it that way is if someone stops up the laundry sink or they're soaking some, I don't know, jeans or something like that to, to get some stains out of them before they do the laundry, and then that night the water softener regenerates, it's gonna overflow, okay? So, why does why do why do the plumbing codes require that? Well, they require that because if there's a sewage backup, that they don't want it to back up into the line that is connected to your water softener. And if the water softener happens to be going through a regeneration cycle at that time, and if the water softener is creating a vacuum through that drain line, it could suck up some sewage inside that. Okay. 
doesn't happen very often, I can assure you. Um, but that's why they do it that way. So how can you do that? Well, there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can use an air gap like this. This is an air gap. Can you see that? You're focusing? Yeah. Okay, great. An air gap like this that attaches onto the plumbing. The drain, the drain line goes onto here, and then it gives you that, um, that air gap inside here. So you can do something like that. Um, you can do, actually, I got a picture here. You can do something like this. And uh, so this is where you create in the, in the plumbing. This is um, the wood that you see there are the floor joists. You can uh, put a Y in there. I'll show you, I got some pieces here. All right. You can put a Y in the plumbing line there. Let me pull that out for a second. You can put a Y in the plumbing line. And then from there, let me give you a full screen here again. You can put a Y in the in the plumbing line, okay, Y like this, and then go something like this. Can you see that? And then put some uh, a stack up here, and then run it into that stack. Maintain your air gap, and you're you're good to go. And so if you have access to all those things, then you can make that work. But like I say, sometimes you don't have access to all those things. So if you're doing the plumbing yourself, you can choose to have it done to do it without an air gap if that's what you choose to do again it's not to code but often that's the only way to do it and the other thing you have to be careful of is when you have that air gap okay if you're connecting up an foc or an fob make sure that the 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 stack is high enough and the air gap so that when the water comes out it doesn't go spill out and i've seen that happen too it spills spills out and sprays out all over the place so you definitely uh, want to avoid that um you know, are there some ways you can do it without the air gap if you so choose? Yeah, you can. And uh, again, this isn't to code, but you know, it's up to you, right? So this is uh, a Y that you can put in the line and then you can put in a fitting like this. Oops, is that focusing? Yeah, there. All right, so then you just put in a fitting like this. Connect up your drain line here, put the Y in the line like that, and you can go for that. So, um, like I say, sometimes that's the only way that it can be done because of space restrictions and things like that, but it's not to code. So keep that in mind. How many times have I ever seen or heard of a water softener backing up, sewage backing up into a water softener? Never. In 20 years, I've never heard of it. I've never seen it. Um, I'm sure someone will have a story about it. And if you do, please share it with us uh, during this live stream or in the comments down below after the live stream. But I've never seen it happen. So how many times have I seen uh, water spray out of the air gap? Lots of times. How many times have I seen the drain line come loose? Lots of times. How many times have the laundry sink overflowed um, because uh, the, someone drained the water softener into the laundry sink? Yeah, about 15 or 20 times over the years. Um, so I've seen those things a lot more often than I've heard of the, the other thing happen. But remember, it's not to code. So, um, you know. Think about that as you're moving ahead, right? Okay, great. Um, so last live stream I did, uh, the next day uh, a gentleman named Josh who was participating during the live stream um, submitted some uh, pictures. And uh, so let me show you. He sent them to me. And uh, I don't know why this ended up looking kind of sideways, but uh, it did anyway. So... Um, Sorry about that. It's kind of hard to see, but uh, basically the the line that's vertical that's vertical. The line that's vertical is his uh, going. Let's see if the next one's a little bit better. Yeah, I don't know why these ended up sideways, but anyway. So um, sorry about the picture, but do you see the the line that's now horizontal? It's actually vertical. It goes in, so it's going into his um, into the the drain line behind his washing machine that's where it's connected to so he submitted these um, images to me um, and sent me a, a very nice email just saying that uh, he was uh, encouraging me to to um, present them during this because uh, i was talking about uh, water softener installation during this uh, live stream and uh, and i appreciate him submitting them but he was just concerned that why the plumber did it this way and why there was no air gap and chances are the plumber decided this was the best way given the circumstances that were there. And uh, so like I say, if there was the opportunity to install an, an air gap,
he, he probably would have. But I don't think there was, given the pictures that I saw. Um, the other option would have been to run it into the laundry sink. And again, I think that would be a much poorer choice than the way he did it. But again, that's my personal opinion. I don't write the plumbing codes. Um, but, uh, you know, keep that in mind if you make those uh, decisions. So if you want to get some more detailed information about... Um, about the drain connections etc i do have a, a good video about that obviously i'm biased when i say that but uh, so i'll put a link in the description down below water softener installation it's part of a i think this is a five part series about water softener installation and i've done five different videos obviously so number three it talks about drain connection options and it goes through some of those in a little bit more detail than i have uh, right here um, so I definitely encourage you to check that out if you're not sure where to uh, connect your your drain and um, uh, Yeah, so Disaster number 15 just yet another story about the drain line popping off and not being secured properly at the other end You know, we talked about this end at the water softener end, but at the other end and uh, Drain lines connected together So this is something you can do if you have a water softener and you have an iron filter, water softener, tannin filter, water softener, and a backwashable carbon filter, um, you can connect the drain lines together. So you can have one drain line like this, put a T in it, right? And then connect, is that focusing? It likes my face more than it does there. And then uh, going to the drain. So you can connect the two together. Um, some precautions you have to take when you do that. Um, but you, it can be done. In a perfect world, you'd connect two separate drain lines, but often that's not possible or just not practical, um, but you can connect the two together. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind. So disaster number 16. So this one I saw a few years ago. What happened was um, a customer had a plumbing company um, install a water softener and then they had problems and an iron filter and then they had problems with the iron filter so they called me to replace the iron filter with one that I recommend so I replaced the iron filter everything was fine and then I guess about a year later the the water softener that the plumbing company installed was there was something wrong with the valve so they chose to remove the valve you know take the valve off the top and to remove it to take it away to rebuild it but the two drain lines were connected together. We didn't connect them together. They were like that from the original installation. But what happened was they didn't, um, <laughs> they didn't do anything about securing the drain line. So in other words, the, the connection for the drain line to the water softener was still open. So when the iron filter went into its backwash, it, instead of flushing the, the debris from the iron filter to the drain, it took the path of least resistance and came out where the water softener was supposed to be connected, which of course wasn't, and it spewed all over the floor. Made a huge mess. It was a, a big disaster. So keep that in mind if you're, if you're connecting the two lines together. All right, installing or reusing existing three-way bypass. So these are the bane of my existence. If you've seen any other of my live streams, you've seen this before, but for those of you who haven't, I'll talk about it here. So this is a three-way bypass. And the reason it's such a mangy looking thing is I took it out of a customer's place. So uh, modern water softeners have the bypasses built in now. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So this is the bypass here. And the reason you have a bypass is if for some reason you want to take the water softener offline, maybe to fill a swimming pool, if you've got treated um, outside taps, or maybe the water softener springs a leak, whatever reason, you just turn these two valves, water softener's offline, okay? Years ago, um, water softeners didn't have built-in bypasses. So what happened would be when the installer was installing them, they'd install what's called a three-way bypass. So how it would work if you follow the arrows, water would come down here and go into the water softener. So this valve would be open. And then water would come out of, whoops, <laughs> would come out of the water softener and go up through here. So this valve would be open and this valve would be closed. Now, if, if for some reason you want to bypass the water softener, all you do is close this one, close this one, and open this one. Well, what happens is, Somewhere down the line, someone says, hey, I don't have very good flow in my house. Um, can you have a look at my, where my plumbing is? And someone goes in there and looks around and they go, huh, this valve here is closed. How about we open that? And they open the valve and they say, ah, it seems like the flow's better. And they leave it open. And then all of a sudden, a few weeks later, 
I get a phone call, my water softener isn't working. And I go out there and sure enough it's not because the water again is taking the path of least resistance, doesn't go through the water softener or softens it a little bit and then goes on from there. Or the other thing that happens is that someone comes in to do some work either on the water softener or some other aspect of the plumbing and they want to shut off the water. So what happens is they come in and they close all the valves. This one, oh, it's already closed. Okay, no big deal. They do whatever work they've come to do, and then when they get, they're ready to leave, they open the valves. So they open this one, this one, and not thinking, they open this one. Again, the same problem. Three-way bypass. So if you've got an existing one on there and you're installing a water softener, cut it out like we did here and go without it because they're nothing but trouble. And uh, you'd be amazed how many service calls we get um, for, and that's the problem, three-way bypass. All right, um, we talked about that. Solder, solder-free tail kits. Yeah, so, you know, I talked about that a little bit early, earlier. It's something you can think about, whichever makes most sense for you. Um, just be careful, excuse me, with the solder-free ones, that you follow the correct procedures when, when, in, when using them. You know, that, um, like I say, when you're doing the, the um, PEX, or sorry, the shark bite ones, make sure you actually draw the line on here and make sure you shove it in all the way right to the line. Make sure you do that. Don't take any shortcuts because it's not worth it. Um, uh, plumbing your water softener backwards. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that happen. Um, especially, you know, when there's a lot of pipes and things like that, and it's hard for the plumber to follow. So what typically happens is water softener gets installed and it's not working and, uh, no one can figure out why, um, I had one of these calls not too long ago. Somebody else installed the water softener. They called me in desperation because the guy couldn't figure out what was wrong. I went out there. Sure enough, it was plumbed backwards. So the meter wasn't working and uh, the water softener didn't know when to regenerate. It could have caused a whole bunch of other problems, but luckily it didn't in this case. So we just switched the plumbing around and we were good to go. Um, when you're doing a drain line, when you first start to put the water softener into service, um, I always recommend using opaque drain line. In other words, a drain line you can see through. Can you see that? Uh, not really. Okay, that you can see through. Actually, if I put a pen inside here. Do you see that? You can sort of see the color of the pen in there. So the, the thing about that is when you start putting the water softener into service, you can see the water flowing through there to the drain, but you can also see um, if it's just air going through or when the water starts going through, or you can see the fines going through there, especially if you're doing a carbon filter, there's going to be a lot of carbon fines. So you see dark stuff going through and it's good to see that to, to be able to know when the dark, the fines are gone. It also happens with iron filters, um, carbon filters, sulfur filters, things like that. So uh, do that and um, whatever you do, don't use this stuff. This is clear vinyl and don't use this because this stuff kinks so easily and, uh, and it may not kink initially. You may get away with the initial installation using that stuff. But a year, two years, five years, 10 years down the road, it kinks just under its own weight and it'll actually clog itself, believe it or not. So don't use that stuff. All right, we got some more questions here. Let's see what's going on. And uh... oh, here's a good question. Will an iron uh, remover remove tannins? Absolutely not. Not at all. Um, the technology for removing tannins is totally different. If you're, uh, if uh, some of the other folks are wondering, what are tannins? Tannins is an organic. Uh, it's typically caused caused by uh, decomposing vegetation that tints water. Now, tea is a, tannins. Wine is tannins. So, like I say, it's, it's from an organic that tints the water. Whereas iron is a mineral that can also cause coloration of, of water. You need a tannin filter to get rid of tannins. Iron filter will absolutely not work. And I've got, if you're interested in some more information, uh, just add something in the comments down below and I'll add a link. I've got a great video that talks about how to tell if you've got tannins or iron, um, that kind of thing. So uh, great. Uh, where are we here? Rich, Gary, thank you. I appreciate your knowledge. Well, it's inspired me to rebuild my own. That was size too small for my house before I bought it. Thank you. I learned a lot from you. Well, that's great, Rich. Um, take it on as a project. Um, like I say, there's, you know, things that you, you need to do, but um, you'll definitely understand water softeners a lot more once you finish that project. And that's great. 
I'm glad I was some help to you. Uh, is Aquasure a good water softener? I don't know. Um, I don't know all the brands of water softeners out there. Um, I don't come across an Aquasure uh, water softener. Something I vaguely recall something about them, but um, I think it's one of those water softeners that you have to replace every year. I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I'm just guessing. But I did do some research for someone on that, and I can't remember what it was, so I'd rather not uh, say any more about that. Um, here. Please remind listeners not to drain into septic systems. Yeah, this one comes up a lot. In a perfect world, you're right. We wouldn't drain into septic systems. Um, the only problem is sometimes that's the only alternative that you, you have to drain into septic systems. And um, sometimes you'll get corrosion on a concrete septic tank at the outlet. Sometimes you'll have some concerns with the septic system because of the water softener. Um, it's pretty rare, to be honest. Um, I do see it sometimes, but it's rare. Um, and like I say, in a perfect world, yep, we'd all have um, dry wells and we'd all drain into the dry well um, if, if we're not on sewers. Um, and up here in cottage country where it freezes, <laughs> we have to have somewhere to, to drain it to that's not gonna freeze in the winter time. So, uh, yeah, if all things being equal, absolutely, I wouldn't run into the septic system, but a lot of times we do. Where is it in my house? It goes to the septic system in my house because, you know, I, I, I just don't have the ability to d dig a dry well and make sure that it's winterized. So, but thanks for your comment. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. And, uh, Sean, just bought our new home this past July in Shenandoah, Shenandoah, Virginia. Uh, never had a software before and I've learned so much from you. I'm looking to replace the whole system, but I assume you never, sorry, uh, you never installed, sorry. They had the brine tank filled with salt and water for brine, but no line or way for the brine to draw into the valve and tank. Wow, that's bad. That's really bad. You, you have to really wonder like, who would have installed something like that that they didn't even know that they had to connect the two together, right? Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Yeah, anyway. How critical is the incoming water temperature? Well, in terms of um, softening the water, in terms of um, uh, removing iron, uh, anything like that, installation-wise, it really isn't all that critical. I mean, the obvious is that it can't be frozen, but uh, a water softener softens the water if the water's at 35 degrees Fahrenheit or if it's, um, you know, 80, 75, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, you can't get up to 100 or 110 degrees Fahrenheit, um, then you'll have problems because the water softeners aren't made for that inside. They're not made to run hot water through them. So I don't know if that's where your question was leading, but generally in, in the, what the, the water temperature we have at household waters is not an issue at all. Um, yeah. Sean. So there's calcium buildup everywhere. So needless to say, but I feel a little overwhelmed by all the different valves, manufacturers and hoopla. I just want my three going on four young children and my wonderful wife to have good healthy drinking water well that's it and um and you know sean uh, by participating and watching my videos and that kind of thing you're learning a lot more and you're going to be able to make some great decisions of what's best for your family and that's what we're all about here and uh and i appreciate everyone's uh comments uh so far um uh, we still got a little bit to go here but please um submit your comments and go from there um, yeah, we were talking about disaster number 20, and that is the drain line actually closed right up because they used that vinyl stuff. Correct assembly of drain well float and overflow. So um, if you're installing a water softener from scratch, I find that the, the biggest area that people struggle with, at least with our water softeners, is connecting to the... Um, where is it here? Connecting to the, the, the brine line to the float. I find that that's the, the, the biggest area of concern and that's because it has this quick connect fitting on it and um, so basically you have to just remember to remove the clip here from the quick connect fitting. There's an uh, insert here 
that goes into the end of the line, which should be here. So here's the brine line. Here's the little fitting. You shove that inside. And then you push all of this. Is it going to focus? Yes, yes. All right. Push all of this inside here. It's going to stop. You're going to think you're done, but you're not. Keep going. And you push it all the way home. And that and yank on it to make sure it's locked. I find that's the biggest thing that people struggle with is uh, that connection there. So if you're installing your own water softener, um, have a look at that. <laughs> all right. And uh, so that's the one I see. Like I say, I see it leaking from there. I see it not drawing brine. I see that with water softeners, tannin filters, when people do their own installations. So definitely do that. The other thing I've seen happen uh, recently a couple times is on the outside, on the outside of the brine tank, you got one of these babies here. It's called an overflow. And recently I've had a few people that took the drain line from the water softener, put a T in it, and connected it up to the overflow. Not a good idea. So what happened was the water softener would go through a regeneration cycle. And while it's flushing to the drain, it's also running water back into the brine tank. So uh, don't do that. The overflow, if you don't have a drain nearby, if you don't have a sump pit nearby that you can run the uh, a line to, just run a short uh, line out of there, put a bucket underneath. 99% chance there's never, ever going to be water coming out of there. But if it does, at least it's going to go into the bucket. So, all right, water testing before installation. So, you know, you've gone through all the steps we talked about so far. You've got it all installed. Now you have to program the water softener. The biggest thing is you need to know how hard your water is. So my first water softener I installed 1983, long before I was in the water filtration business. Installed it myself, bought it from Sears, and, um, and it said in there, program the hardness. I had no idea what the hardness was. So whatever it was set at from the factory, must be good enough, and I put that in there. That's not the way to do it. So you either call your municipality or you have the water tested by somebody like myself to tell you how hard it is, and then you program it in there to do it properly. You'd be amazed at how many times I see that water softeners are not programmed for hardness. And often, and I'm not being critical of plumbers, but often what happens is plumbers don't carry water test kits with them. So if a homeowner asks them to install a water softener, they go, they install the water softener, they don't know how to program it. They don't want, uh, the homeowner isn't gonna pay them to read a manual and figure out how to program it. And, they're, and they don't have a water test kit, so they don't know how hard the water is. So often the default settings, which are usually fairly high, are in there. I was in a home not too long ago that had a water hardness of five. They had a water softener in there. They've been there 20 years and it had been programmed at 25 grains per gallon of hardness. So they were using way more salt and way more water than they should have for all those years just because it wasn't programmed properly. Um, and uh, so, uh, so definitely keep that in mind. I do have a video here somewhere. Here. Um, yeah, so I, I do have a link to a video. Again, it's in the description down below that talks about water softener settings and what kind of settings to use. So, um, and it talks uh, there about, um, uh, like I say, um, how, how to set it up and how to do the programming. And I've got an extensive um, uh, video. Again, I've got another link to, I'll, I'll show you the thumbnail in just a second. But really what you need to, to figure out is the hardness, the compensated hardness. So if you're on, uh, well water and you got iron in your water and you're using the water softener to remove the iron you have to put in a factor there to compensate for the iron in your water and do that so basically what you need to know is the compensate or what you need to program is the compensated hardness the days override the regen time and uh, those are the three things you really need to know now again if you buy one of our hume uh, water filtration uh, water softeners the um, Days override's already programmed in. The reach end time's already programmed in, unless you want to change it. So all you have to put in there is the compensated hardness. So again, um, the, the link to the video will, uh, sh will show you that. And, uh, and again, I've got another video that talks to how to test for water hardness. And uh, again, I've got a link to a video to that, so you can check that out. And, uh, oh yeah, this is the video I was talking about, uh, the, the water softener settings. It goes into great detail about the settings. And again, you may want to check that out when you get to this stage. Okay, let me go back to here. And, uh, all right, putting the water softener into service. So you've got it all connected up. At this point, you would have the water softener bypassed. 
Okay, then you turn on the water from your shutoff before here and you check for leaks. Assuming there's no leaks, then what you do is you put the water softener into backwash. So to do that, you, you I don't have this one plugged in, but uh, you press the regen button, you hold it down for five seconds, and then you'll hear the motor go into backwash. As it starts counting down in backwash, you open up the inlet valve. So this here would be the inlet valve. You open it up halfway, and then water will flow through, and then you'll see water flowing, you'll see air flowing to the drain, and eventually it'll be water flowing to drain. So once you see water flowing to drain on a steady basis, then you can start opening up this valve more. And it should take about eight to 10 minutes to get the valve all the way open. And then you've got a straight stream of water flowing to the drain. Once you've got water flowing to the drain, then, um, sorry, then you can um, go to the, to the next cycle. So it'll either automatically go there, or you can push a button to, to take it to the brine cycle. So then at this stage, you would dump five gallons of water into the, the brine tank with or without the salt at this stage. I usually just put in the water in at this stage. And then you just make sure that the brine cycle, you can see that, that the water is uh, slowly, slowly being drawn down. And then you can um, fast forward it to the end of the cycles. And then you can check for uh, add the salt. Once you've done that, then you can open up both sides of this and then go to somewhere where you've got a good flow, um, either a laundry sink or a bathtub or somewhere like that. Let the water run to flush out any debris that could be in here. And especially if you're installing like an Aquamaster AMS 950 that has carbon in it to flush out those carbon fines and that kind of thing before you run the water into the whole house. Um, so disaster number 24. So yeah, we've had this one a number of times where we've installed a water softener, like I say, an Aquamaster AMS 950 with the, with the carbon filter in it, and the customer gets gray water. And uh, so that just means we didn't backwash it long enough. I mean, the cure for that is just to let the water run, but unfortunately, it, it's kind of messy and that kind of thing. So um, if you're installing something like that, I suggest you go through the backwash cycle a couple of times before you start running the water uh, to the house. And... Uh, in case you're interested, this is what an Aquamaster AMS 950 looks like. All right. Um, oh, disaster number 25. So this one, before I got in the, into the water, fil actually, when I just started getting into the water filtration business, I bought um, from myself uh, a water softener, a tank and tank water softener, in, had it installed, and uh, everything was fine. The next day I come and it's overflowed. I couldn't believe it. So I called up the folks that I got it from. They said, no problem. They came and switched out the water soft, or they came out, they checked the water softener. Oh, a couple things were loose, da, 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 that kind of thing. So they, they scooped out a lot of the excess water, put it in the, you'll be fine. Next day, overflowed again. So the tank was cracked. I couldn't believe it. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. In 20 years, uh, have I seen more than one or two cracked tanks? And it happened to me with my very first one in this industry. But anyway, so uh, replace the tank. Of course, everything was fine. So the moral of that whole uh, disaster was keep an eye on it. If you installed it, kind of keep an eye on it. Mention to the homeowner, have a look down here uh, tomorrow. Just kind of see if everything looks okay. Um, and I always usually say, just, you know, I've checked for leaks, but you can always just have a quick look around. Just check for leaks. If you notice anything, give me a shout. Um, I had one, this is one they had nothing I installed, not a water softener I've ever seen before. It's a water softener that was about, I guess, eight or 10 years old. It was a really weird brand. And all of a sudden the lady came home one day and she said water was, she heard water spraying downstairs and she came out and one of the valves at the side had given away and this very super narrow stream of water was shooting out and it actually drilled a hole right through the drywall. Never seen anything like that, but very odd. Um, uh, another one that I've seen is uh, my lawyer actually called me. He said, oh, I've got this old water softener downstairs. It doesn't seem to be working, but it just doesn't look right to me. I went down there and it was downstairs. And it was a fiberglass tank. Didn't have a cover on it like this one, but the fiberglass was actually like this. It was actually starting to unravel. And I couldn't believe it. That thing could have burst at any second. So I just bypassed it and I said, yeah, you need a water softener. This thing replaced right away. And he didn't seem to be too concerned about it, strangely enough. But um, uh, another one I see is mold growth. Uh, that's disgusting. And you'd be amazed how often I see it in restaurants, food. Oh, it's just terrible. So 
all of our Hume water filtration water softeners and that come with these neoprene jackets. And, uh, and if you put one of these neoprene jackets on it, and after five years, it'll look, your tank will look exactly like this, totally spotless. And uh, because you won't have the condensation forming on the outside, you won't have the mold growth on it. And uh, it's, 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 it's amazing uh, the difference that it, it makes. And uh, so uh, definitely recommend that. And if you already have a water softener, you can order uh, one of our neoprene jackets. Um, and uh, we sell hundreds of them a year and uh, put it onto your own uh, water softener. And by the way, if you're wondering where this stuff is that I'm talking about on our websites, so we're at uh, wateristore.com in the US or wateristore.ca in Canada. We offer free shipping and discount pricing. And I definitely encourage you, if you're thinking about getting into so any kind of new water filtration products, to check us out and uh, we'll go from there. And uh, great. And uh, oh, here's that, um, that video I was talking about. And again, I've got a link in the description down below for um, uh, checking, sizing your, your tank for a, a jacket if that's what you need. Definitely recommend it. Uh, bypassing, not bypassing outside faucets. So again, we talked about this a little bit at the uh, at the beginning in terms of planning your installation, whether you want to bypass the outside faucets. So it really depends. Um, uh, when it comes to hot tubs, that's the big one for me. Um, in my last house, I had a hot tub that was built into a solarium. It was an indoor hot tub um, in it. And um, I used softened water in that hot tub. And every... Um, hot tub place told me not to do that. Well, I found that it was much easier to control the chemicals. Uh, when I went to chemical free system, it worked better with softened water. And I, that heater in that thing lasted 25 years. So, and if you have a hot tub, you know, heaters typically don't last 25 years. So, and I found the maintenance was so much less than that because I use soft water. So again, keep that in mind. If you're a car guy like I am and you wash your car and stuff like that, softened water is much better for that. So kind of keep those things in mind when you're planning that. Um, and again, we talked a little bit earlier. Um, uh, you know, if, uh, if you're interested in more videos like this one here, I definitely encourage you to press the subscribe button, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and uh, you'll be notified of all the new videos they become available. Um, we talked about uh, slowing down the water flow, going from one inch plumbing to three quarters, back up to one inch. Um, Frozen water softeners, frozen. So there's a proper way to winterize water softeners. So if you're in a situation where you've got a cottage or a cabin and you don't use it in the winter time, you need to winterize your water softener properly. And it can be done. Uh, do I have a video here? No. I do have a video on that. Um, if you're interested, just put it in the comments down below and I'll uh, submit a link that you can check that out. But there is a definite procedure and it definitely can be done with any water softener, any iron and sulfur filter. I find it's easiest to do with our system if you have a, a water softener that's a tank in tank. In other words, where this tank is inside the brine tank, it's much more difficult to do. But, uh, but so again, if you're planning your water softener installation um, and you, you know that you're going to be uh, winterizing it, then I definitely suggest that uh, you don't get a tank in tank water softener. All right. And uh, let's see. Great. Keep those questions coming. I still got time to answer those questions. Uh, but anyway, the whole point of the thing is if you don't get the water out of this thing, it's going to burst. If you don't get all the water out of the nooks and crannies in the valve, it's going to cause damage. So uh, there definitely there's a, a procedure to do that. Another one that I've seen, this is a disaster. It wasn't caused by me, but uh, what happened was, um, you know, the drain line. We talked about the drain line from the water softener. So what happened was it had a, a more flexible drain line on it. And uh, what happened was there was a cable, it was a very tight area in all fairness, and a cable guy or somebody came through, and the other end of the drain line was not really well secured. So what happened is he went walking through and he knocked it off. And he saw it was knocked off, and he thought, oh man, where does this go? So he saw the, he saw this, <laughs> and it fit onto that, so he put it on there. So of course what happened was the next time the water softener went through a regeneration cycle, all the regen water ended up back in the brine tank. The brine tank overflowed and it made a big mess. So that's why we make sure we secure the line on both ends tightly, right? Uh, frozen drain line. Yeah, I see this one a lot in cottage country uh, where it's, it's sometimes for various uh, reasons, people don't want the water draining into the septic tank, as we talked about a little bit earlier. So they put a hole in the wall and they shoot it out the wall. They put it maybe on an angle like this, thinking it's going to drain down, but they don't realize that the cold goes all the way up through 
and ends up uh, freezing that line and then the water softener won't work or it can actually even burst the drain line uh, just from the water in there let's see how we're doing with questions here guys um another way, a comment a question from al uh sean last comment made me wonder about whether some people are drinking softened water can you discuss this please gary hey that's a good question al so the last house i owned uh was built in the 60s and it had a water softener in there that was probably installed oh, i would say probably in the 60s or 70s and uh, what they did was they bypassed the kitchen cold faucet and uh, so that they wouldn't be drinking softened water. Well, back in those days, water softeners were incredibly inefficient. And uh, so what happened was there was a significant sodium residual in the water after the water softener. Well, modern water softeners are super efficient. And so what that means is there's almost no extra sodium in the water after the water softener as there is before the water softener. Now, in a home like mine, so I'm on well water, I have an ultraviolet disinfection system. My water's a hardness of 15, I believe. And uh, so the pretreatment requirement for that ultraviolet disinfection system is a hardness of seven or less.